I remember going to bed that night and just praying. Like I said, Lord, can I please see him again tomorrow? Like, I don't know what the plan is and all this, but I just remember saying that prayer. And like, now I look back on that, that's a really heart-wrenching thing to say. Like, give me one more day. Um, that's how I felt. Like, I just, there was no um, reassurance given to us by our medical team that he was gonna be okay. And so I just remember thinking, Sometimes it feels like our life is in the complete mercy of doctors, machines, needles, and kidney formulas. I mean, our son literally gets hooked up to a life-saving machine every night that without, he wouldn't be here. We get scared sometimes. We feel hopeless, lost, and anxious for the next alarm or hospital stay. But what we've learned is not that our son's life is fragile or that he will never live a quote-unquote normal life or even that he might never use the bathroom like normal kids. What we have learned is that in the midst of trials such as this, the Lord sustains us. His glory will reign over Sully's life whether he lives or dies. His physical body may be sick, but Isaiah 35, 6 says, the lame will leap like a deer. Whether that's here on earth or in heaven, eternity is not defined by machines, doctors, or pain. Lord, we ask that you use Sully to glorify you and only you. Hey everybody, I'm Billy. This is my gorgeous wife, Taylor. Yep. And <laughs> we have a little guy named Sully, who is now just over a year old. Um, but today we're going to tell his story, and it's taken us a long time to be able to sit down and do this. Um, because he's had a lot of things that have gone on in his life. He's currently one year old and on dialysis, waiting for a transplant. And she is the one who's very close to getting approved to be his donor. Yes. So a lot of things happened from this 20 week ultrasound yep. to now. And yes. we just figured we should tell it because yep. we just want it documented so Sully can see it later in life. And so you guys can hear about the miracle that Sully has been and what God has done in our lives in this crazy, crazy <laughs> season. Yes, and this video is probably gonna be a little longer than what we typically post, but that's just yeah. because we wanted one place where if you really wanted to know everything that's gone into it, you could come here and learn. Yeah. Um, so kind of the structure of this video, we're going to talk about the 20 week ultrasound, which was basically the diagnosis leading up to birth. That's going to be like the first section. And then the second section is going to be the birth and his first hospital stay at a specific hospital, <laughs> which we later transferred to a different hospital. And that will be the next section and then everything beyond that. So. so let's jump in. 20 Sorry. week. So at the 20 week ultrasound, uh, well really right afterwards, we found out that Sully had a condition called posterior urethral valves. And funny thing, we were actually, we packed up the car to go on a road <laughs> trip as like our baby moon, which I hate that word, but Taylor likes it. So we drive to the hospital to do the ultrasound. We're like, sweet, this is awesome. Taylor's mom came with. We're all woo, woo, woo. He's yeah. so cute. He looks like Billy. That's what everyone was saying. Already? No. <laughs> um, and then we go back out to the car and we start our road trip. Mm -hmm. And not an hour down the road. We get results. Yeah. And if they come that quick, normally something's going on. And so we opened it and saw that term, posterior urethral valves, also known as PUV. And in some ways we were like, oh, it's his bladder. That doesn't sound too Yeah, what bad. can go wrong with your urethra? Like, yeah. come on not something you hear about very often and we did some research and kind of the first thing you find out online is that it can actually be a very deadly birth defect um and if it's not it can cause lasting kidney damage that then your child will have to deal with their whole life yeah it's rare for a kid to live a completely normal life yeah. with this that happens. happens there's there's kids that the the, the blockage in the urethra was very small, so it just kind of causes a little bit of damage, or it just causes a little bit of damage to the bladder before it went up into the kidneys. Um, just kind of how PUV works. So it blocks your urethra, urine can't get out while you're still in the womb, and yes, babies do pee in the womb, kind of a fun fact. Yeah. Um, and then it just backs up that whole urinary tract into yeah. the kidneys. So it's the bladder balloons huge until it can't take it anymore, and then your ureters, the 
part that connects your bladder to your kidneys bursts open and then it fills your ureters and then once your ureters are full and they can't take it anymore then it breaks into your kidneys and that's kind of the the end stage of it yeah. which that did happen to Sully but a lot of of these kids that that happens to they end up dying before birth mm -hmm. because and the issue is so when babies are peeing their pee is actually their amniotic fluid and so um babies start to kind of practice breathing when they're in the womb and their fluid is what inflates their lungs and so if a baby has no fluid then their lungs don't develop properly and that's what is most um deadly fatal um about getting this diagnosis and so quickly we met with doctors and the plan of action was to have ultrasounds every other week and they really look at the amniotic fluid because um, you can kind of tell kidney damage um, but what kidneys look like on an ultrasound isn't always the same as how they function so you could have a kidney that looks great and doesn't function or a kidney that the tissue is totally destroyed but somehow it's hanging on so really at this point they're looking for fluid so every other week we would go in kind of knowing what we were going to find and if this baby was going to make it. Oh, but you're skipping something. What if I skip? When we first found out oh. that the diet, when we first found out that it was confirmed, um, they gave us the option to terminate. Oh, yeah. Which we later found out that half of the babies that get this diagnosis in utero are aborted. And... That was not on the table for us. And we let them know that. They never brought it back up. But anyways, that's how it started. Yes. So Yep. So he yeah. beat that on. He beat that on. Yeah. And then we do these ultrasounds and everything's going really well for a long time. Um until was it thirty three weeks? Six days. Yeah. Yep. So we go in for our ultrasound. It's actually the day after Christmas now at this point. And I remember just and like... the day before my birthday. The day before your birthday. <laughs> and I remember like every time we'd finish ultrasound, I'd be like, okay, now I get to enjoy Thanksgiving. Okay, now I get to enjoy Christmas. Mm -hmm. And so the day after Christmas, we go in and we're thinking, maybe we'll get to celebrate New Year's. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> um, and we got pretty good at reading ultrasounds and immediately we could tell it was different. He was just like so squished in there. Yeah, it's normally there's like a space habit. between his face and the, what's that thing? I think it's the uterus. The uterus. The womb. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I'm not a doctor. <laughs> but uh, it was like. Yeah. And we found out that he had basically no fluid, which is called oligohydrominose. I'm probably butchering how you say no that. Um, I didn't even know that. But at that point, it became, okay, we need to talk about delivery as soon as we can. So they set me up to get two steroid shots in my bum. So I did that that very same day and then a day later. And then they had to kind of work in my body for a little bit. So we went back in. Um, the first ultrasound was on a Monday. We went back in on a Thursday. The 29th. Yes, the 29th. And they said, bring your hospital bag. There's a very real chance that we'll take you from our office over to the hospital and you're having that baby that day. And we get there. They make that decision. So we head on over to the it's hospital. Just across the street, which was kind of nice. Which was nice, yeah. Um, and so you could tell there was kind of like confusing communication because everything was being so rushed. And so we go to check in at the labor and delivery floor and they're like, who are you? What's going on? We're like, they just sent us over. <laughs> and then our doctor shows up and straightens everything out. But there was actually another emergency that day that was more urgent than us. Yeah. And so my C-section got pushed to the next day. Yep. So. December 30th, 2022. Yes. So second section now. Because we checked in the day before because they pushed it off, mm -hmm. that was a crazy day. Because, like, we were just sitting there waiting. Yeah, <laughs> so we, they admitted us to the hospital, um, and we had to spend the night there with, a, like, a fetal monitor on my belly. But there was, like, nothing to do. But there was nothing to do, it so we just, were just waiting. Yeah, and yeah. they also told us, like, and we've read a lot of stories about kids with this, and, like, when they're born, you don't know if they're going to be alive. Mm-hmm. Because you don't know if they're going to be breathing. You don't, mm -hmm. and a lot of them don't. A lot and of there's so many stories too. of families and their babies born, and they only get to be with them for like 20 minutes. Yeah, so we're just. So we're thinking, I don't man, even tomorrow, know how to that feeling. tomorrow's going to be the greatest day of our lives. But it or, could be one of the hardest. It could day be we've like the, the hardest day. And ever. then we just had to sit and wait. Yeah, so we were probably just. I mean, I was eating. I was eating a lot. 
And I think we watched that John Krasinski show. Oh, yeah. What's that called? Jack Ryan. Jack Ryan. That's a good show. <laughs> yeah, so we were I watching that John and trying to distract ourselves. Read up some scripture together and just... Yeah. Just trying to get through it. And so... Um, oh, fun fact, too. Immediately when you get admitted, they test you for COVID. <laughs> and I had no symptoms, but somehow I tested positive for COVID. So then we were, like, quarantined, too, and people couldn't come visit us for a little while, and... That changed a lot of things. They had to call infectious disease management to see if I could even, like, meet my baby. And it turns out, if we would have been in there two weeks earlier, she would have given birth to Sully and not been able to see him for ten days. Ten days. You don't even know if the kid's going to live. What if you only have an hour with him and you can't even see him? Then we went to bed that night. I actually slept. I have a talent for being able to sleep pretty much at any time. Yeah. Um, And we woke up the next morning and immediately started prepping. Or the C-section. My nurse was actually somebody we went to college with, which That's is kind hilarious. of funny. Because <laughs> I don't know if you know, but when you're getting a C-section, nope. they got to do some stuff. <laughs> That's all. I'll we leave it there. Go into but that. it was funny because they weren't really friends, but they're friends now. Yeah, we know each other well. Yep. Um, so she got me all ready for the surgery. She was the one who held my hand like when they did my spinal for um, the C-section itself. Um, Billy got all like gowned up and masked up and met me in there once I was already numb, pretty much. Yeah. And keep in mind, we didn't say this, but there's a urology and a nephrology team, we were told, that was going to be watching this all happen. Yeah. And so they weren't there. They would know how to act if he was born and he was in worse kidney failure than maybe they thought or better. Mm-hmm. But they weren't there. Which We was, have the NICU team. Which, they were great. Yeah. Fabulous. Um, but... Yeah. Man, I remember sitting in that waiting room. Because they wheeled her back by herself. Yeah, they do that for C-sections. Yeah, so then I had to go wait out in the waiting room. I'm fully gowned up. I've got a big old beard at the time, so it's, <laughs> i got this big old thing on. And there's people out there, like, just waiting to get checked in. And I'm, like, pacing back and forth, <laughs> praying to God. I was like, Lord, give me peace. I'm going to pass out. And, uh, yeah. And yeah. then they were like, you can come back. Which it felt like two hours. I think it was, like, 15 minutes. It, was, it wasn't that long. But... But in a C-section, they pull the baby out pretty much right away. So I would say within five, ten minutes of you being in the room. Oh, it was maybe two. Yeah. It was quick. He was out. Yeah. And the first thing he did was he screamed. Which, which that was big. I mean. Oh, it's the best feeling in the world. Yeah, because that obviously shows life, that he's breathing. Breathing. Um, that's really the only time I cried through. Up until that you point, that was the only time I ever cried before yeah. this. Because I always felt like. And I don't know why, like, not that God spoke to me, but I always just felt like he was going to be, he was going to be alive. So yeah. I kind of kept that in the back of my mind all the time. So it was easy for me not to cry. But then when I saw it, I was like, yeah, wow. You said he looked like Voldemort. <laughs> that was like, after I cried, realized this is beautiful. And then they held him up and he was all like shriveled. And there's a scene in Harry Potter where Voldemort's all shriveled up like that. And that's what he looked like. But. But then anyway. we quickly realized he was very cute. And he was not Voldemort. No. Yeah. He was a very special boy. And um, afterwards, a lot of this kind of turns to me because you take, you go with the NICU team because they immediately take Sully. Which, um, that was a weird experience because, like, I'm just with my wife sharing the most beautiful moment of our life. And then immediately, they hook him up to a bunch of monitors and they're like, all right, let's go. And I'm like, yeah. she's still, like, sliced open. Like, is yeah. she going to be okay? <laughs> so I was then in the deli- delivery room, operating room, uh, by myself. And it takes about 40 or so minutes for the C-section to finish. And you hear, like, my doctor at one point was like, uterus, back in place. And I was like, oh, heavens, <laughs> this is alarming. But, you know, just breathing through it, getting over it. And then you go to a recovery room, ask the mom. So I've only seen Sully for, like, a glimpse of that um, before he was wheeled straight away. And then you're kind of giving people... My mom could be with us at this time, and my dad. My sister, maybe, too. Yeah. So well, they're you, kind of giving me updates. And you... Yeah, you didn't know if he was going to... If you'd ever see him again. Yeah. Because they didn't ever... Scary. They didn't tell us in there he's doing okay. Like, yeah. they just were like, all right, let's go. And in our minds, everything we read and what our urologist told us is like, there's a chance they have to act quickly. Yeah. The most important thing is getting that urine out. Yeah. Because when babies like this are in the womb... Um, 
the placenta kind of acts as a dialysis unit. And so when that help now is severed, then you really start to see what the kidneys are going to do. And um, Which, when I left the room, I was thinking, like, all right, it's go time. Like, we're going up yeah. to this floor. They're going to check his kidney function, and we're going to go down to surgery or whatever. They're going to poke. I don't know how it works. Get his process. Get his urine out somehow because to get the and stress they, off his kidneys. They but didn't even do a catheter. I, like, got out into the hallway, and it was just, like, casual. Like, these two nurses are just... Their job. And I'm thinking, like, what the heck is going on? Like, do they not know that this kid, it's not, he's not just premature. Like, did anybody tell them <laughs> that, yeah. like, his kidneys are full of fluid right now? And then we went up there and they hooked him up to whatever they were going to do. He and had then, a CPAP. And then they left me in there alone with him. And I was like, this is not. You're trying I, to figure out what was going on. Yeah, I just was like, there's got to be something we can do for him. But the, mm-hmm. And then I, they came back in and I was like, have they figured anything out, like, with his kidneys or whatever? And they're like, well, he peed when he was born. And I was like... He leaked. What? Come to find out. Yeah, but they said peed. So I'm thinking, oh, my gosh. It's a miracle. Yeah. He's fine. He's fine. Yeah. No. Um, yeah. So then on my side of things, I don't know a ton of that that's going on. I eventually learned that they were going to put a catheter in. But that should have been done right away. So if you're ever in this scenario, just make sure that gets done and done right. Um, But eventually I get to leave recovery like an hour or two later. Um, And they wheel me. I get to see him for 15 minutes. I got to hold him with all of this stuff on him. I couldn't really even see his face because he had the CPAP on. Um, But I just like sobbed. And then they had to take me up to postpartum. That's something that's really hard um, when your baby's in the NICU is that your postpartum room, normally your baby's with you. But in our case, He was on a whole other floor of the hospital in his own room. So we're trying to, like, split our time. And I wasn't allowed to go back down there until I could walk again. Mm -hmm. So I I made myself walk. That first night... My mom stayed with him. Yeah. And I stayed with Taylor. Yep, so I could get up and go to the bathroom. Because I was having the hardest time figuring out how to pee again. (laughs) So I ended up having to get a catheter and everything in the middle of the night. But I remember trying to get her to pee because she didn't want to get her... She didn't want to get a catheter because obviously that's painful. So I was trying everything to get her to pee. Because if you don't pee after a certain hour mark, then they cat you. Mm-hmm. And I was, like, getting trying to get hot water in a cup to dip her hand into, <laughs> like you do, like, at sleepovers with your buddies or whatever. And um, Nothing the, the, hot, the water wouldn't get that hot. So it was, like, lu- yeah. it was like a little bit warmer than lukewarm. And it almost worked. So I think if it was hot, <laughs> it probably would have worked. Because, Maybe. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, so we're dealing with all of that. First night goes, he's still stable, but I remember, um, I remember going to bed that night and just praying. Like I said, Lord, can I please see him again tomorrow? Like, I don't know what the plan is and all this, but I just remember saying that prayer. And like, now I look back on that and that's a really heart-wrenching thing to say. Like, give me one more day. Um, that's how I felt. Like, I just, there was no, um reassurance given to us by our medical team that he was going to be okay and so i just remember thinking like 24 hours can i just have another 24 hours so i went to sleep and you know they teach you to pump every three hours and so i'm doing all of these things whatever i can to try and be there for him um and the next day he gets off any breathing support it was by the grace of god his lungs were perfect so we get to see his face finally, and he's so cute. And he was 5 pounds, 14 ounces, so he was actually pretty big for being six weeks early. Um, Again, and, by the grace of God. <laughs> yes, and it quickly, we start to sense this pattern with his care team of the urology team and the nephrology team are really hard to get a hold of. There there's this absent. There's like one of each, and they check in maybe once every four days, and he had a really high need to be checked in on well at one point i was literally begging them to come in because he was four catheters in Mm -hmm. and they kept giving and his so the catheter that they put in him was supposed to last it was like an indwelling catheter so it should have just constantly been emptying him because his bladder was so thick he couldn't pee on his yeah but they put the catheter in it would drain a ton of urine Mm -hmm. and then it wouldn't drip again ever. ever and i'd be begging the nurses please please help us figure out why this is not draining and they're like well you drained him already 
okay, that was 24 hours ago. You're telling yeah. me he hasn't made a drop of urine? Yes. And they're like, well... Uh, his kidneys are damaged. His kidneys are damaged. Okay, and if so, he's not producing urine at all, then we need to be thinking about something else. This is an else. even bigger issue, yeah. Yeah. And so every time we'd, like, plead our case to whatever nurse was on our kiddo at that time, and eventually we'd get a new catheter and drain a ton and then nothing for 24 hours yeah. and then drain a ton. So he had 10 catheters in, like, the first... Days of life. And one of the big risks of changing catheters that much is a UTI, which he did end up getting one because one nurse who was very, very intelligent. She just didn't. She didn't use this. And I, we had seen them do the sterile tons technique. of yeah. the sterile technique. And this lady didn't grab the sterile table. She didn't grab the sterile match. She didn't grab the sterile gloves. And as, she was, and as she was inserting the catheter, he pooped, like sprayed poop on the catheter. And she just Put it in. kept going. And I was like. And then we uh, noticed his urine getting cloudy with what would drain. And so we had to ask for them to test for UTI. So all of this was kind of just like the breaking point for us. It was like, why are we the doctors? And obviously you have to be your kid's point of contact. Right. But like it was it, awful. It was really bad. And then really, before I asked for a transfer to oh. the children's hospital was, I called our urologist, and yes. who I hadn't seen in days. Yes. And... I said, how is he doing? Like, no one has said if he's doing bad. No one has said if he's doing good. Um, we don't know what to think. We don't know what to think. Like, I asked him, is he going to die? And obviously, the doctors can't answer that. But he said, well, he has hydrophrenosis mm -hmm. in both kidneys. So that's not good. That's all we got. And then, to, and that's it. So then I was like, what are we going to do about it? And he said, well, we have to wait till he's big enough to get rid of the blockage so that way his pee can drain. And I'm thinking, like... There's got to be more than that. <laughs> there has to be more, because right now we're draining his pee through a catheter. Mm -hmm. So why do we have to... Like, why can't we do whatever's next? Because yeah. it's obviously... It's draining. They just have to keep redoing the catheter. Yeah. But in that moment, I was like, we are getting out of here. And we're then that night, we called, like, the head nurse on the floor, the charge nurse into our room and she brought her whole team and one of the neonatologists that like prenatal doc or neonatal doctors and they basically just said like we don't know what to do and when it's two in the morning and you have a group of doctors and nurses saying we don't know what to do they said they'd never seen it before we said okay then we're going to another hospital yeah and they said okay let's start getting the paperwork going for and them. then a new doctor comes the on doctor of the year the next day comes in and he pretty much like got in my face, like yeah. really talking down to me as if I'm some peon that doesn't know anything about my own son, which obviously I'm not a doctor, but I've witnessed all of these things. We've, we've been living at the hospital. Yes. And Weep. it was Weep. not up to my standard and Sully was going to die. We later found out he would have died. died yeah. But this guy had the audacity to say, if it was my kid, I would not transfer to Seattle Children's. And... We were like, dude, first of all, that is a terrible thing to say to somebody. Yeah. Like using your own yeah. family to manipulate somebody another family into making a decision for their kid who's yeah. dying. And this guy doesn't even realize it. Eventually, I was like, I don't care what you say. Seattle Children's has a full team. We're going to go. We're going to go. And he so, was like, fine. And he walked out of the room like that. And then a nurse followed him out and was like, are you really going to do that? Are you going to talk to them like that and throw a fit? So he came back in, trying to act all cool. For some reason, takes off his mask, which, whatever. But, like, <laughs> the hospital's, like, super strict. Wear a mask, this, yeah. wash your hands here. And he gets in the room and try to act. He takes off his mask. Relatable. And it's like, oh, okay. Basically, he says, okay, we'll let you guys go. Or, like, yeah, he will let us go. Yeah, so then. But it's And then he tells us, you know, just be warned. Children's NICU is open bay. You're not going to have a place to stay. You're going to have to commute. Um, they're very, like, they take on some of the hardest cases, so you may not get in for, like, a month. Yeah. But we'll see what we can do. Children's, here's our case. We get the call in a day. Well, really, right away, they were like, this family needs to be here. Yeah, so it's kind. Yeah. Hi, sweetheart. Oh, hold on, hold on. I think he's thirsty. I'll go get it. Oh, oh dude. <laughs> you thirsty? And when we finally got to Children's, there was a urologist or nephrologist? Both. We saw like six doctors that night. We didn't get there until later, too. Mm -hmm. And one of them said, we've been waiting for you. 
That was the urologist. Yeah. But if we back up a little bit, it was really weird because Sully had to get, like, all packaged from this little cart thing. Do you remember that? To get transported, and then we followed... It was like a bulletproof yeah, tank. Yeah, we followed the ambulance up yeah. to Seattle Children. <clears throat> but we get there, yeah, they're waiting for us. Immediately, we got to meet, like, the head of their whole nephrology department. Um, and then we met lots of urologists, and we were in the NICU, and it was so nice. It was the Ritz-Carlton. Of NICUs. It was amazing. Yeah, and, like, they had told us it was going to be open day, we wouldn't be able to stay, all this stuff, but... Children's has, like, 31 or 32, like, individual rooms. You have your own bed, your own bathroom. It was way your own better. Nurse. Yeah, Every nurse one-to-one is one-to-one nursing. One-to-one. And uh, room service. Yeah. The showers were nice. You get, like, a discount on food if you're a breastfeeding mom. Yeah. I mean, they just thought of everything. It was like, we should have been here all along. Yeah. But uh, what was funny is that because Sully was stable and they only have 31 beds Mm -hmm. they moved us down to the kidney floor which is in the next day the oldest part of the hospital which was not the ritz carlton and obviously it's it doesn't matter because he's getting the same level of care but and uh, that's what we really needed we needed the specialists yeah but it was like a culture shock because like we had roommates and our room was it was like the the nicu room is that we had to ourselves they like threw two people into that with like a curtain and um, ours was the closest to the door. So anytime mm-hmm. a doctor came in, they walked right past our heads while we're sleeping. Mm-hmm. Or, it was really bright. And uh, our first roommate was like kind of noticeably coughing a lot. Sick, yeah. So we were nervous about that. And then like literally within hours of being down there, um, a code blue is called, which is like a medical emergency. So we're like sitting in our room, and every medical professional like goes running. Yeah, the nurses. Will and there was drop a mom like doing. crying because her son had. I think it was a heart attack. It was just yeah, like it was awful. We were just like, what is going on? Yeah. Um, and it's not their fault. That's just the nature of being in that kind of a place. Yeah, that um, was, it kind of opened our eyes to what. One, that's what Sully has isn't that bad compared to... I mean, it's bad, but it's not like... There's kids out there that have had multiple heart transplants. That live at that hospital. There's yeah. kids that have lived there their entire lives. And, yeah. Yeah. But we eventually got switched to the other side of the room. So we were, like, deeper into it, not right by the door. And that was a game changer. Yeah. Um, and then eventually we had a roommate who was a baby as well. And that helped, too, because... Um, when both of the roommates are babies, they're not using, like, the shared bathroom. Um, but if we had a roommate that, at one point, we had, like, a 12-year-old roommate. Mm-hmm. And she got access to the bathroom, which meant we didn't have access to it at all. Yeah. And I was, you know, freshly postpartum. And so there's a lot of reasons why you need a bathroom. Mm-hmm. So I was having to, like, walk through the hospital to try and find bathrooms all the time. And it was just really nice once that kind of settled down and we had a little bit more of a routine. Yeah. Um, but immediately, Children's, there's a wonderful, I think he was a resident there, Dr. Chestnut. Chestnut. And he figured out the catheter situation. They used, like, an x-ray to get it right into place. And, and they, it worked. They didn't have to change it. He, yeah, he knew what he was doing. He figured it out right away. And he was shocked that the other hospital that we were at was just letting any nurse. Yeah, he's like, this is very specific. We don't let our nurses do this. Yeah. We met with him. And then my favorite encounter those first few days was we met with a doctor, Dr. Kane. Um, he was a urologist, and he came in the room. And it was just me and my dad at this point. Yeah, I don't know what I was doing. I think well, you could only have two in the room. I think you were going to, like, get food or something. Yeah. And he talked to me, and he, he said, like, almost in these exact words, like, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. Your son does have some issues. Um but the good news is, is that we have solutions to those issues. And I just remember, like, weeping. Because it was the first time I had heard somebody say, like, this is treatable. Yeah. Um, and then we met with a kidney doctor who said that Sully had a great chance of life. Um, it was 90% survival for that first year with what he had. And the biggest thing was avoiding infections and sicknesses. And they t- told us for sure he will be on dialysis at some point. Mm-hmm. And, uh, but... Immediately after saying that, they were like, 
there's lots of families on dialysis that live great lives. Mm -hmm. Like, don't worry too much about we'll it. We'll walk you through it. Yeah. So, we always thought dialysis was, like, the end of the world. But Yeah. But they give us hope. Yeah. And, and they then, started with the hope, too. They, yeah. They didn't want to let us get too down. Yeah. And we had another nephrologist, Dr. Nguyen. And she took, oh my gosh, she's phenomenal. She took so much time to answer every single question we had. Mm -hmm. I mean, she would spend like an hour in our room just kind of like teaching us yeah. what was happening, how all of this made sense. She drew us diagrams. She was really the one that like equipped us to take care of Soli. And then she was added as his primary nephrologist. We didn't even have to like advocate for that. We just got her yeah. um, for the first nine months until dialysis and then his doctor switched. But Oh my gosh, she was a total godsend. I I hope that like post everything we get to go back to her care too. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Um and then we quickly found out too they wanted to run some of their own tests. Um they don't necessarily it's not that they don't trust another hospital, but they want to get their own eyes on it. So they ran um a VCUG, which basically is like contrast in your urinary system so they could see what's happening. Um, and then some x-rays and trying to figure it all out and quickly found some things that the other hospital had missed. Um, and so we had to schedule surgery and it was basically because like we've said, his bladder got really thick. The muscle just was constantly trying to compress in utero and it couldn't. So it got really thick and it actually like cut off one of his ureters. So that ureter was still in there just swelling with urine. Whereas the other hospital thought that that ureter and that kidney we're fine. We're totally fine. Mm -hmm. But at Children's, it was like, we need to get that cleared now. Because yeah. that's the only... Was that the kidney with the that's function? That's the big kidney, yeah. yeah. So, if I'm just assuming, if we would have got it cleared at the beginning, he would have had more kidney yeah, function. More. Yeah. yeah. And I problem. asked our surgeon when she was done, just to be clear before I say that this uh, other hospital was killing him... Um, like, is his, was his kidney being more damaged? Mm -hmm. And, like, kind of what would have happened if this wasn't cleared and not good things? Yeah, it would have yeah. continued to damage that kidney until there was no function left. And by the time he had the surgery, his function was only, like... I think he had, like, 15%. 15, yeah. In one kidney. In one kidney. And then the yeah. other kidney, we came to find out, had none. And it's completely shriveled up since then. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, so they brought that ureter to the surface so it could drain without the bladder and then brought his bladder to the surface too in that surgery that they did when he was 17 days old. So he has two holes in his lower belly mm -hmm. that leak urine. And that's a temporary fix. Well, as he gets older, there's different things they can do to make that more, you know, livable so he's not in diapers or having different things going his whole life. But that was what they could do in that min moment with him being so small because they couldn't get the actual blockage out because i mean a baby's urethra is like so small yeah um they didn't have the scope and they didn't want to damage the urethra yeah but for now we don't even worry about that kind of stuff because mm -hmm. you just we put together like this contraption of a diaper where it's yeah. one smaller diaper and then a bigger diaper with two massive poise pads wrapped around so it keeps them dry keeps them dry and we also came to find out too that sully is polyuric mm -hmm. So when your kidneys fail, um, they either produce way too much urine or, like, no urine. And he's the first one, so he produces so much urine. And so in that initial hospital where they would say, oh, he's just not peeing, like, we've already had the catheter in place, that was definitely not the issue because he actually produces way more than he should. Which means um, it was backing up. It was further backing up. Flooding so, his kidneys. So, in short, we're so, so thankful for Seattle Children's. Um, They've just been 